Welcome, everyone, to the Slade Ham Experiment. If you use your context clues, I bet you can figure out who I am. This is my experimental program. It's a half century old numerically. Uh, we have crossed the threshold of 50. I think this is the 51st episode, which means I have rambled and ranted and raved for, for a long time. Um, you haven't missed anything. Welcome to my midnight spaceship. That's what the glowing uh, surroundings are. Um, it's blue tonight. My mood changes. It depends on my mood. So it's very red sometimes. Uh, so cheers to you guys. I'm blinking. I'm tired. I'm on tour. It's been a busy, a busy month. Thanks to everybody in San Antonio. Fantastic shows two weeks ago out at LOL, part of the improv family there. I was in Fort Worth this past weekend, and holy smokes, you guys are good. That is one of the best comedy clubs Man, it's been, it's been a good club for a long time. So I'm off to Colorado Springs this week. I'm traveling. I'm on the road. I'm not doing... I'm flighted out this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to Fort Worth and talk about the rest of Fort Worth in a second. But I'm off to Colorado this week, and I'm, I'm, I'm just done with flying. United, you, you've made it too difficult. You've made it far too complicated for me to uh, rein in your gold status again. Somehow this year, I've been back and forth to Japan. I've been back and forth to the Middle East. I've been all around Africa. I've been to uh, to Kentucky. I've been to I've been I've been I don't know. I've been gone almost the whole year, and I'm not even gonna. And I've still got Chile in November. And I still don't think that's how I'm. I'm so unconvinced I can even reach it. Looking at all these flights that I've punted and gotten, I burned miles on Canada coming up, and I'm driving to Colorado because my soul needs to sleep under some stars. I'm gonna camp out. I think I'm gonna stop in Paladura Canyon. Um, I think I can say that because I will. Have, this will have come out after I've been there. Um, I think I'm gonna stop camp for the night. Tie my hammock to a tree, sleep under some stars, and then drive the remaining 350 miles into Colorado Springs the next morning. That's what I think is going to happen. That's what I need to do. No more airplanes, no more airports, no more doing this the fast way. I got to go from A to B. I'm going to sit in it. The road is good. I missed the road. I forgot how much I missed it. Till I went to Fort Worth this week, I drove up there a couple hours north of Houston. And it's going to, this week prompts me to talk about feature acts. Now, the feature act in stand up, if you go to a standard comedy club, your headliner is generally the person you're going to see, the last person anyway. It's the person doing the meat of the show, usually an hour. And you have your MC, your master of ceremonies, who hosts the show. They usually do 10 or 15 minutes up front. They welcome everybody out. They're usually a local, someone who's got a day job. That's usually part of their material. But they make everyone feel at ease. They set the standard for how comedy works. They make the club announcements. Then your feature act is direct support for your headliner. Your feature act has, a, has simultaneously the easiest and hardest job on the show. Okay? The MC's job is tough. You got to pull a truck out of the mud. I don't know if you've ever just walked up in front of 400 strangers who were just sitting there. You know, they know a show's about to happen, but they don't. They're ordering drink. The, if you go to a, I, most people go to a comedy club. Let me backtrack this to the beginning. A couple of times a year, maybe. Usually once, maybe. Does anybody go anymore? Maybe. Um, but there's protocols to it, just like anything else. If you were to go indoor skydiving or indoor rock climbing, you would have to sort of apprise yourself of the unspoken rules of the environment you're in, right? Oh, this is how things work. We have to go get our tickets here, and then we wait in this lobby, and then they go seat everyone at the same time, and then the waitress takes our drink orders, and then we watch the show, and then we pay our tabs. If you don't know all of that, the protocol feels weird. So when a show starts... It's kind of jarring, right? Oh, well, wow, the show's starting. So you're the MC trying to welcome everybody out 
and start telling jokes. You're a young comic. You're a little easily rattled already, probably. This is tough. Your material's not that great. Now you're doing it in front of people who are, wait, oh, did the show start? Okay, hang on. I was going to get one more drink. No, wait, let me run to the bathroom. I thought we had more time. Did you park the car? Yeah, I parked the car. You parked it far enough? It's just people jawing and jaw jacking and thinking about the kids. and They haven't settled into the show yet. And this kid's got to go up and perform in front of that. The headliner won't dwell on him too long. That's who you came to see. You know what you're going to see. An hour of good comedy. He's going to bring it home. He's going to navigate the check drop when those checks all come out in the middle of his set. All that stuff's going to get handled. Your night's going to be fine. But the feature has a responsibility to the show. He's the turning point. He's the pivot from the amateur to the professional part of the evening. When the MC brings up your feature performer, that's when the night is really beginning. Not that your MC is a throwaway. He has... Possibly the most important job of the night, but comedically speaking, it's not your job. It's your job to set the tone, hand the baton off. And your feature act is going to go up, and he should be a bridge to your headliner. That's the, simple, that's the simplest way I can put it. He should be a great performer who sets the stage for the headliner to have an equally great performance. Now, not all features are created equal. I will be temporally vague as I speak of a couple of people. Um, one, I don't remember his name, so it doesn't matter. You couldn't find who I worked with anyway. It wouldn't matter. I'd tell you his name if I remembered it. This kid. I've only disliked a few features. I had one guy... One show in Louisville who did nothing but crowd work and he wasn't good at it. He just bullied a bunch of the front row. That was pretty miserable. I had fans and friends out there that night. One of them, pretty autistic actually, sitting in the front row, getting screamed at by a comic, doing that reverse heckling, just making funny. Why are you out here by yourself? And this dude doesn't know how to tell them because I don't have any friends, because I'm socially awkward, because no one will hang out with me. He doesn't know how to do that, so he just puts his little head down and the guy, the guy is just railing him. Can't get a woman? What's the deal? And I just, you know, I had to go up and apologize to this poor kid during my set. I was in Milwaukee once. It was a billion years ago. I was working for this. Did I tell this story? Already? I can't remember. I told it somewhere. Anyway, the thermostat on the wall was locked at like, 80 degrees or something. You couldn't even, like a chimpanzee in a cage. Anyway, that feature act told on me. And uh, that dude can suck it. But there's another feature act who went up. And man, it's, when you're doing comedy, the stage that you go up to, the way the room has been treated before you get up there dictates a lot. So if you're a, let's call you a straight black dude, okay? And you're supposed to be doing 25 minutes, okay? And first of all, your material choice is poor, okay? I'm going to keep saying K just to, just to check in with you. This guy's supposedly taping a set. Supposedly working on what he's going to be recording, which is coincidental because as am I. I know what this process is. It's stacks of pieces of paper and lots of lots of work coming off stage, watching tape, checking the lines, rewriting lines. It's constant. It's constant. It's a process. So I think, wow, this dude, he's got some, he's got some clout in terms of people, you know, the credits and the and you, this is I'll watch. I've never seen this guy I'm talking about, a more atrocious middle act in my life. Straight black guy. Supposed to be doing 25 minutes. Cutting himself to 20 minutes. Nah, man, I'm just going to do 20. I don't even know how that was allowed. And then almost his entire act, I'm, in, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but a significant portion of it about trans people and gay people, and he drops the... The gay F word, is that the, I don't know how to say it without YouTube censoring everything. 
like 20 times in his set. He drops the N-word like 100. It's a casual, lazy delivery. Everything about it was pretty pathetic. And then, then he attacked the table. And this is where I sort of get, look, man, if you're going to be a comic, Know when it's you, okay? Know when you're the one tanking the room. I have done some terrible shows in my career. And I have had, because this is, this is what hecklers love to yell. They love to yell right at your gut. You're not funny. And that, that is a, that's a sternum punch for a comic. You can tell me I'm a lot of things, but don't tell me I'm not funny. So I get it when you're, when you're tanking a room, when you're into... When you're literally in your 20 minutes, you've managed to do jokes about gay people, jokes about trans people. Uh, you've done a George Floyd hackety hack uh, three years sober line. You, you've done a bunch of other jokes about George Floyd. You've done some pretty racist stuff. Um, and then when you got to your abortion material, you're surprised that someone in the crowd in one of the long, awkward silences said, you're not funny. And then you chose that opportunity to dive right into them and force these five women to leave the room. I won't tell you when this happened, but this dude's terrible. Coming with all this Austin heat. I'm Joe Rogan's boy. I'm Louis C.K.'s boy. And here's the messed up part. This dude is funny. He's just so much ego and arrogance. Come walk it. So I remember, this is what I remember about this week. The dude asked the club manager, are you the waitress? Can you get me a drink? And I just giggled. Because that tells me everything I need to know. This is a dude who's been doing comedy about six, seven years, getting this first few feathers in his cap, especially in Austin. The mothership is kinging people left and right, making them think they're shit. I love Joe Rogan, but damn it. Look at, look at, your, look at your crew. Anyway, this guy is actually funny. Brain works funny, knows how to write a joke, has a really, really, really good stage presence when he lets it shine. And just all those tools, and then went up there and painted a, what it looked like elephant throwing paint at a canvas. It's like, you got skills, bro. You got a brush and words, and you're good at this, and you, ah. It's terrible trying to do stand-up comedy. This job sucks. Anyway, I don't know why I'm bitching about feature acts. I'm just, probably because I'm on the road and I'm thinking about it. Uh, I don't know who I'm with in Colorado Springs, June 23rd, 24th. Come find out with me. Um, I was going to do a top five today. Uh, I did top five last week, uh, top five movie soundtracks uh, in my world. I'm going to try to do a different top five today, but only because it was prompted by a conversation prompted by last week's episode. Um I think I, I want to do the, these are the top five projects I would like to see done right, okay? If I, had, if I had the ability to make great film, if you just gave me $200 million and all the people who knew how to make the things happening in my brain happen in the real world, I have so much to learn. I can never convey it to all of them yet. I'm just saying, hypothetically, were these projects to land on my desk, I'd be happy. These aren't in any order. Um... The first, I'd like to see something by Frank Frazetta done right. I'm sure there's arguments for lots of different things. But my friend Chase DeRusso left me some books when he moved to New York that, that have all the Frazetta works in them. And I mean all of them. And he covered so much space. The Barbarian, uh, he did a lot of, uh, a lot of Conan's uh, style Bar barbarian stuff you remember the death dealer the guy with the axe on the horse the egyptian queen but he did a lot of edgar rice burroughs stuff tarzan john carter of mars and i'd like to see a good frazetta-esque john carter of mars i'd also take a good tarzan done that style they may have tried it but i don't think they did um they definitely didn't do it well so Frazetta is up there, the Frazetta universe somehow. The closest I've ever seen probably was the 80s Conan stuff, um, if I'm being perfectly honest. And that's a terrible, terrible thing to use as an example of something good. Um, two, 
What am I going to say for last? The one I would do myself for sure. Two, I think, is going to be a property that I remember from my comic book and video game days. Turok Dinosaur Hunter. The reason I want to see it done right is because there's no wrong way to do it. It's been a mess of ideas. When it first came out as a comic book, it was about an Indian kid and his friend who lived in the desert, and there were a bunch of dinosaurs. And like all good things back then, there was no background. It was perfect. Then in the 90s, it kind of got revisited again. I think Valiant picked it up. They turned it into another Native American guy fighting dinosaurs. Then they confused all that again. Then there was a video game. And this is what I remember more fondly than everything. And in this video game, you played this, this, this Native American dude who rode dinosaurs, and they had a little cybernetic stuff on their head. And that mixing of worlds is what I really enjoy. That's why I think the... I was talking about Frazetta a minute ago. Now I'm talking about dinosaurs. I think the closest I've seen to both those things pulled off well is a little series called Primal. It's... Uh, is it on Hulu now? Netflix? It's on something. HBO Max. The reason Primal's so good is what I'm about to get to in these, these coming up, uh, my number two and number one. Number three is a complete departure. But what was so good, what I think would be so good, because what, what I enjoy about Primal, what I think would be good about a Frazetta universe, what I think would be cool about something like Turok, there's no dialogue in Primal. It's all just animation. It's just grunts and flashes and, and fights and emotion. And I think this is what we need out of film. I think we need to see the, the corner turn because we're done watching, watching regular movies. We're bored. I just watched Transformers. It's good. But I've seen it all. There's only so many beats you can show me on a flat screen and have actors reenact. They've all been done. Every story's been told that way. We need something new. I think something that's a little more abstract, something that's an experience. We're about to have all the tools. VR is coming out, all these different interfaces, haptic sensors, all this other stuff. We ought to be pretty close with virtual reality and implants and everything else to being able to give people completely visceral experiences, right? Because film is just like, it's like heroin. It's, I've never done it, but I assume that people who do heroin do a little bit of heroin and then they need more heroin and then they need more heroin and then they need more heroin to get the same effect. And that's all we're doing with film. When dinosaurs first came out, right, whatever stop-motion versions, we all marveled at until Jurassic Park, and then, oh, holy shit, these are even greater. And now nothing's impressive at all anymore, nothing. So film's going to have to go a different route. Whatever this experiential thing is, I think it should be when you leave, you should feel like you felt what the characters in this film felt. You should be given an entirely different experience. That doesn't apply to this next one. Transor Z. This is my favorite childhood cartoon that no one knows about. In the mid-80s, Transor Z should get more credit. It's an American dub. The original is called uh, Mazinga? Mazinger? Mazinger Z? It was a Japanese manga from the 70s. Weirdly, the very first mech... Um, they, did, they didn't exist. Giant robots piloted by humans. There were giant robots. Mechagodzilla, stuff like that. But giant robots piloted by humans, the entire mech concept, what's so famously Japanese that we think started with Gundam, actually started with Mazinger Z. It was a manga, and then it became an anime. And it's a robot. It was a Monster of the Week kind of series. They, they dubbed it in English. In 85, they ported over 65 episodes. They dropped, they dropped all the Japanese references. They, they changed a ton. They very Americanized it. And it came out around the same time as Voltron, which 
completely overshadowed it. But I remember Transor Z, and it would come out every single week. He was a giant robot. He was piloted by this guy who sat in this little pod that landed in his head. And every week, he fought a different mechanized beast. A um, what did they call it? It was Doctor Demon in in American. Um, not Doctor. It was Doctor Hell in Japanese. Doctor Demon in American. Doctor Demon would deploy. His mechanized beast that each week was a different robot with different weapons. Some of them had guns that came out of their chest. Some of them had blades that were their shoulders, but then they could take them off and hit you with them. They had cannons for arms. Every week was a different trial and tribulation, and every week Transor Z had to fight a new cool robot. And I don't know how you bring that back. I don't know how you do that in a neat way. You can't. But, man, I'd like to see that revisited. The last two, one's an obvious one, one isn't. If he gave me the keys to the world and let me drive, I would do a Thundercats movie. And I would do it very primally also. That universe is a little Frazetta-esque in itself. Orange skies, red skies. Pretty 80s fan fantasy. I think you could do that movie with almost no dialogue. You give those characters real primal traits. You still do the story. You still have the characters. But more along the lines of what they're doing with the Spider-Man multiverse, into the Spider-Verse type animation, those are better ways to tell stories. It's, they're new. That's why it feels good to us. It's fresh hair hoy. That brings me to my number one. I don't know if you're going to. Nobody wants to see this. Nobody does. I don't know if it's because it's been done terribly the only couple of times anyone's touched it. I can only think of one, maybe two. But Mega Man. reason it popped into my head, the closest thing I've seen to it even looking right happened in the Transformers movies. Um, this last one, Transformers 7. It's no secret. I think it's in the trailer. There's an exosuit. You might remember those from the original G1 Transformers cartoon. It's a suit that a human can get in that's a little Transformers-esque. There's a Mega Manist, Mega Manist, Mega Manist looking thing I'd ever seen in my life. It made me think about how much I would love to see a good Mega Man movie with the full-blown Hair metal, not hair metal, but like Dragon Force. That You know that band, Dragon Force? They should do the soundtrack. And they should do the original Mega Man songs. There's a killer piano version of Mega Man songs from Mega Man 2 on Spotify. You should listen to it. Video game music, highly underrated. But I think you could do a Mega Man movie too where he traverses the levels and each one feels a certain way and you give a different experience. You don't have to fill this up with cheesy dialogue or a stupid love story or three acts that work like normal. I think you could give a human being the experience of being Mega Man in 90 minutes in a way we've never done yet. With colors and with sound and with movement. I got all this, I got all this stuck in my head. I don't know how to get it out yet. But Mega Man's in there, a Dragon Force soundtrack, lots of poppy colors. That universe as the coolest place in the world. Every, for, for me, as a kid, a lot of the stuff that sticks with me, if you look at Transor Z, you look at Mega Man, these were these things where every week it was a different cool thing to discover. With Mega Man, there were different weapons to discover. Every game that came out, there were nine more. Eight more? Nine more. One, two, three, four, six, I think eight more. I can't remember. Eight villains and every game, they made a square in the center was Dr. Wiley, so it had to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, <laughs> did I just count squares in the real world? All right. Math isn't my strong suit. These are the ones I'd want to see. Frazetta's Universe, Turok, Dinosaur Hunter, Thundercats, Transor Z, Mega Man. I just want these things handled with kid gloves. Don't come in and do what you're doing to Star Trek and Star Wars because I, I will flip the whole tabernacle. Do you hear me? Cheers to all of you. I'm in Colorado Springs this week. Come see me. A uh, couple of shows in Texas. Kerrville, July 8th. The Riot, July 2nd. Canada, the back half of July. Uh, those two weeks are going to be there. I'll be rounding out this show. I might put some other stuff in August before I tape, but August 19th, tickets are on sale. I have a comedy special. It's coming out. You guys are awesome. 
Uh, I'm going to hit the road. This episode's going to go a little bit short because I got to bounce, guys. Slateham.com for tickets to everything. I'll see you soon.